It's just after 4 p.m. Los Angeles, so that means it's time for Conservative Revolution Radio on KCAA 1050 AM, the station that leaves no listener behind. Conservative Revolution Radio with your host, Roger Miller. Lock it in and rip the knob off. This week, we feature Steve Aussie, financial guru, We'll talk about the unemployment situation and the artificial number and how it all plays out in America. Plus, returning from New York, running for Congress, it's Joe Gilbert. And Internet Stalkers. We ran out of time last week, but we've got time for them this week. Look out, Iron Mountain, Michigan. Look out, Inverness, Florida. Look out, America. It's not just the NSA spying on you, it's your neighbors. Now it's time to bring him in. Here he is, the one and only Roger Miller on Conservative Revolution Radio. Yeah, it's me, Roger Miller, in the underground bunker here in D.C., broadcasting to you live. And welcome to the show. Great stuff on tap today, as Mr. Announcer Man said, so stick around. Don't want to miss a moment of this one. Great financial advice from Steve Ossie. Returning Joe Gilbert running for Congress with some big news on his big campaign. And those internet stalkers. Oh, God bless them. Here, we'll be right back, right after this. Attention, patriots. There are millions of Americans who have fought for, died for, and survived for our freedom. They are called the American veterans and disabled veterans. We at Breaking Obama and BreakingObama.com have a program to boost the morale. It's called the Patriot Forward Program. Please visit BreakingObama.com today and sign up to be a sponsor for one of these many great patriots. Go today to BreakingObama.com and sign up for the Patriot Forward Program. What is the program? It's a simple program to say thank you to our men and women that have served us so valiantly over the years and are now currently disabled that want to become members of our movement but cannot afford to do otherwise. Visit BreakingObama.com today. Conservative Revolution Radio, I'm Roger Miller, and I'm back. And I want to go into a few things before we bring out our first guest. But I wanted to bring up, have you heard the latest about the uh, Hillary kill list? <laughs> or the hit list? Is it the kill list or the hit list? I think she had two. I think she had a kill list when she was, uh, when she was first lady. But this new hit list, uh, the people that best suit her and, and things like that. you got to check it out. Seven stars. John Kerry made the list. John Kerry was on her hit list. Or is it hit list? whatever the list is it's 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 purely political and not something that you want to be running around with if you think you're gonna run for president <laughs> craziness is abounding in washington they're all nuts can you all give them psychiatric help hey maybe obamacare will take care of it for them if they can get past the twenty five thousand dollar deductible or they can get past paying for someone else's psychiatric care first, or maybe the free condoms or the free uh, whatever else that we're paying for, for other people to get uh, abortions and birth control and stuff like that. Things that, yeah, a good health care program should have. It should have free abortions, yeah, for a 72-year-old. Please, people, come on. Can't we just get real? Can't we just realize that Obamacare is nothing more than a socialist ploy to take over the free market? It's about collapsing an economy. It's about controlling, controlling, controlling. It has nothing to do with giving health care. You can get health insurance, but then you got to get health care. You, you got neither. You got a bunch of cancellations. You got a bunch of businesses going out of business. You got a bunch of people scrambling. You got over 5 million people and counting. And plus, don't forget about what's going to happen in the employer market. It's going to get crazier and crazier, and things are going to get nuttier by the day. It's time to impeach Barack Hussein Obama. Don't forget. This year is the year that we can change things in America. We can regain the Senate and maintain control of the House. Once we do that, 
impeach and prosecute. Then let's just go down the list and take care of the rest of the problem. Now you got other things going on. They're they're calling they're calling this movie that was about American heroes a propaganda film. What's up with that? So what was Stella got her groove back, huh? Isn't that propaganda too? So I I don't know if that makes any sense, and I don't really care because you know what the liberal message makes no sense. So sometimes maybe I'm given a pass, but then that's racist if I bring it up, isn't it? Isn't that crazy? What's going on with that? Haven't they cheapened the word racism? Have aren't Martin Luther King Jr. Isn't he rolling in his grave? Did you see the latest thing that's going on? That's uh, they're sending out twerk party. Uh, invitations over this weekend, and by the way, happy MLK Day. <laughs> I forgot to mention that because if I didn't mention it, I'd be a racist too. But I'm not a racist, and no one's a racist because you know what? That word has no meaning at all anymore with race baiters like the Reverend Al Sharpton and Melissa Harris Perry and all the other clowns like Jesse uh, Jackson uh, Jr. and uh, d- uh, the Reverend uh, Jackson the Third and all of them that go out there and just use the use the oh that's racist oh oh you're a racist it cheapens the whole thing. All of these things that people fought for over the years, you've digressed a hundred years in five years of idiocy and abuse of the system. Get over it, people. Quit trying to make money off of false racism and false narratives. That's enough of a rant for now. I'm going to take a short break and catch a breath and maybe even crack open a soda. I'm Roger Miller. This is Conservative Revolution Radio, and we'll be right back after this. Ever wondered what a bunch of college kids do on spring break in Mexico? Here's your chance to find out. Pick up a copy of My Bad Tequila at MyBadTequila.com or visit Amazon.com. It's available in hardback, paperback, or Kindle or Nook form. Pick up a copy of My Bad Tequila by the author Rico Austin and do it today and join the party at MyBadTequila.com. Hey, this is Roger Miller from Conservative Revolution Radio reminding you to tune in every Monday, 4 p.m., right here on KCAA, 1050 a.m., the station that leaves no listener behind for great, interesting, conservative views on the way the world works. This is a big election year we've got upon us for 2014, so don't miss a show. We've got great guests, all brought to you by Conservative Revolution Radio and BreakingObama.com. Conservative Revolution Radio, I'm Roger Miller, and we're back now and rejoined on the phone by Joe Gilbert, who's running for Congress in New York, and he's got some big news about his campaign. Joe, how are you doing today? I'm terrific. How are you? Doing fantastic. Uh, Tell us uh, what's going on. I hear a little shakeup going on in uh, New York up there. Well, um, not... Yet you may have uh, pulled the trigger a little bit before. I don't want to do ready, fire, aim, and so things are developing pretty quickly. But before I can let the cat out of the bag, I'm sorry, but I'm going to have to ask you, listeners, just to hang on just a little bit longer. Okay. All right. So things have changed from the other day, then. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, I thought I was thinking of something completely different. On my apologies. Yes, Bill Owens, the Democratic incumbent, has dropped out of the race. It is a wide open seat now. It's a wide open seat. So, so you're seeking the uh, Republican uh, nomination. That's correct. Yep. Okay. And so, so there's it's a wide open race. Is anyone stepped up on the Democrat side to try to fill that vacuum, or are they staying away from it? Well, no one's has stepped forward yet. But knowing what I know of the parties, I would just about bet my house that. They had a replacement lined up long before Bill announced that he was withdrawing. Uh-huh. So they're just waiting for the opportune moment. Because I, I think the Democrats, I'm not going to call them stupid. I'm pretty sure that the Democrats realize that the um, petitions are due to the state committee in about three months or so. And so they have three months to really get some name recognition out there and get the petition signed and back up to uh, Albany. And so they're kind of under the gun. And so I don't think they would uh, look too kindly to 
their incumbent dropping out of the race two or three months before petitions need to be out. Okay, I got you. Any other new developments at all going on up there? Um, no, we're just continuing with the campaign. We're in the midst of uh, uh, endorsement and interviews with the, the county GOP committees, and then um, that'll be going on for the rest of the month. And then, then after that, it's a, it's a whirlwind because there's just public engagements and town hall meetings and petitions and getting the ground game going and getting our volunteers energized and out in the street and knocking on doors. We noticed your website's looking really good. That's uh, joegilbertforcongress.org. Um, yes. Yeah, yep. We just um, completed our uh, video, uh, our campaign video that will be going up on the website here in the next today or tomorrow. And then uh, we have another video in production, and the campaign is rolling right along. And your Facebook page continues to grow. You're uh, approaching 3,000 people on Facebook. Right. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, it, it's been really taking steam here in the last couple of days. We picked up about 250, 300 more followers in the last 48 hours. That's Those fantastic. That's fantastic, and hopefully that's can, what it's all about. It's all a numbers game. It's all about when when you uh, enter the realm of politics. If you've got the momentum behind you, that's what carries you through to the seat. Right, and the primary is not until June. Primary is in June. Right now. Well, that's that's not far off when you think about it in the grand scheme of things. But what, oh, it's going to be it's next week. It comes quick. Yeah, by by what you're telling me, I mean you have to you have to get the team together. You have to raise the money. You have to do all this in short order. And the next thing you know, we're voting. <laughs> we're voting. We're right. voting. And then it's up to the people. We, the people, will decide. Is there yeah. is is there ever something that makes you nervous about? Oh, did I forget something? It, Am I leaving something out? I mean... Well, you know, I, have, I benefit from having the experience as a military operations planner, and so I think that um, that is very, in good stead now, and uh, I'm trying to be very meticulous in the details. So It gives you the good... Yes, you're always, you're always wondering. Hindsight's always twenty twenty, and you're thinking... It gives you the That's good... Fine. It gives you the good discipline and, and, uh, and, and work ethic that uh, so many Americans should uh, should embrace, but... Uh, never have the chance to get. Right, right. I wanted to touch base on a on an issue that uh, I saw floating around and has been in the news, and it's uh, it's very disheartening uh, in the movement. Is that uh, have you noticed? Uh, well, I, I know uh, being that uh, you're from the military background, this has to be disheartening. That uh, Fallujah and Ramadi have fallen again, and Baghdad's ready to fall. And uh, basically, the Obama administration has given back uh, Iraq after yes. 4,500 uh, fellow brothers of yours, brothers and sisters, died in, in, in to free them. What are your thoughts on this whole thing? Well, I served 15 months in Iraq. Oh, I'm sorry, in Ramadi. My last tour. I've had three tours in Iraq. My last tour was in the city of Ramadi in Al Anbar province. And, uh, you know, the other two tours were in Baghdad. So you're right, I've got a lot of sweat and blood over there on my brothers and myself. And, you know, it's either one of two things. It's either deliberate or it's complete incompetence or a lack of strategic vision. Or, as Robert Cates, the Secretary Robert Cates has said, that all of their decisions are based on politics and not on strategy or national interest or what may or may not be in the best interest of the soldiers that are putting in harm's way. And it is. It's very disheartening, more than you can imagine. And in 2016, we've got to take back the White House. But we have to take back every single race that we can between now and then. And, you know, at least that when I win in this seat, that I'll bring forward those 24 years of military service and 11 years overseas and three years of combat duty, and I'll bring that experience with me into Congress, and at least I'll know what I'm, what I'm talking about when these issues come up. In the last 15 years, I was a military intelligence officer, and if you can't make good, good decisions on strategy or national interest if you don't have a clear and thorough understanding of the nature of the conflict or the nature of the threat. And I, obviously, this administration does not. They're making decisions based on politics while soldiers out there, Marines, airmen, sons and daughters, bleed and die on the battlefield for nothing. 
it almost seems like the Obama administration purposely uh, had no exit strategy with Iraq to try to blame and make Bush look bad because it has come to light also there are some uh, uh, there's some footage uh, uh, just in I guess it was Robert Gates that brought this up uh, about how they would joke uh, about uh, blaming Bush and how incompetent Bush was and everything else, and his team was incompetent, and, and Gates was sitting there right in the room. Right. I mean, right. what is wrong with these people? Well, I think we know they're socialists, but that's that's another that's another show. Uh, it, it it really kind of irks me that these are the same people that are going to be in charge. And we still have boots on the ground, shall we say, in a big way in Afghanistan. And yeah. we're supposed to be pulling out in a major way this year. I know that we're supposed to be staying uh, for several years thereafter, but not to any kind of degree. Because if, if Iraq sets any kind of precedent about how Obama operates in the, uh, in the theater, shall we say, what is that going to show when we hand Karzai the keys, basically, to the Ferrari, but he doesn't have a driver's license? Well, you know, it's worse than that. If you remember, back in the, when Obama was campaigning for this last election, you know, the bumper sticker line was that Al-Qaeda is on the wrong, and Osama bin Laden is dead, and, and now Al-Qaeda and their affiliate terrorist organizations, they control more geographic area than they have ever had across the Middle East. And, again, it comes back to what are your objectives and what are your motives? I mean, look at Benghazi. You know, I'm a firm believer that if you put anyone, any single American, in harm's way anywhere in the world, you have to have two things. You have to have a clear mission and know what what victory looks like, what they're trying to accomplish. And then when you put that soldier in harm's way, they have to know, and their families have to know, that they are backed up with the full might and fury of the power of the United States. And not just they're going to be left as political pawns like they are in Afghanistan, or left to die like they were in Benghazi. I think what happened was, when when they had the vacuum in Iraq, what happened was, it was very simple. They went and hid out in uh, in Syria and Iran. And then when they got to basically the all clear, you know, it's kind of like the cockroaches came back for more cheese. If that, well, I'm going to let you in a little, kind of, it's not a secret or anything, however, a lot of people call this sectarian violence, that it's the Sunni versus the Shia that is based on religion. That's not at all true. It's not true. This is all about power control. And the struggle is between Saddam Hussein's former regime, the Baathists and Sunnis, who there happen to be Sunni, is not religiously motivated, and the Iranian-backed Badr Corps, uh, Republican Guard Corps, and all the other influences in Iraq that happen to be Shia, and th- that is your fight. It- and it's nothing to do with sectarian violence. This is all about power and control. And m- much of it is all about mafia turf wars and business and money and, and markets. That's why they're killing each other. It's, it's, it's the godfather of the Middle East is basically what it is. Uh, yeah. Which brings to light, too, uh, recently in the last uh, few days, too, uh, I think it was just a couple of days ago, that the Iranian leader, whatever his name is, uh, Muzchev, or I don't know what his name is, I don't I don't really pay attention. Oh, yeah. I don't, uh, You know, the the old guy was, I'm a dinner jacket, because I couldn't say I'm a dinner jod, so I used to say, <laughs> right. I used to call him I'm a dinner jacket. So th- this guy claims that, uh, that, that, uh, He's won over America. That he that America has bowed to Iran. Well, uh, that's only because he's that's, that's only be, he's only saying that because it's right. That's right. <laughs> and, and because you know they can still drive on forward with their nuclear weapon production facilities, and they their their centrifuges are still spinning. They're still um, manufacturing the enriched uranium. They're still doing everything that they were doing before. It's just that. What happened was the Obama administration came forward and told our allies in the U.N. to, to lighten up on some sanctions and to see if we can get these guys in the negotiating table. 
Well, what happened was, I think, because they sent in uh, Herman Munster to do, uh, you know, as Secretary of State to uh, yeah. <laughs> to do that. And then there's uh, then his little clown, Valerie Jarrett, who is Iranian, by the way. Uh, right. Iranian born. Iranian born. And don't forget about the 15 people that are Muslim Brotherhood members that are sitting within the cabinet. What's going on here? Never in American history have we been infiltrated so heavily, and no one bats an eye. You know, that, that's a failure on Congress's part. And that, that's one of the things, like, who's been held accountable for any of the scandals up until the Obama administration has done? Whether it's fast and furious and giving thousands of assault weapons to drug cartel, or it's Benghazi when uh, orders are told to the U- U.S. military to stand down while Americans are dying, whether it's uh, the Tyranian thing or any other thing, the NSA, the IRA suppressing the conservative vote, what, what, any other scandal you want to look at. They're all crimes, but no one's been held to account for any of it. Hillary's got a hit list. Mm-hmm. Hillary's got a hit list, Hillary's and John been- Kerry was on it. Did you see that? Yeah, I sure did. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, lying to Congress is a felony. Yes, it is. If you remember when this uh, the IRS scandal first broke, John Boehner said, I don't want to know who's going to be fired. I want to know who's going to jail. Right. Well, neither has happened. No one's been fired, and no one's gone to jail. Well, it's because they put an Obama operative. They put an Obama operative in charge of the. Uh, it, it's like it's like letting the uh, you know the cat to guard the uh, the cat food. You know, I mean, I, I I don't know what term to use here. <laughs> I got you. I understand, though. Right, yeah. Put the mouse in charge of the cheese. ...legal contributions to the Obama campaign, and she comes from the uh, Civil Rights Division of the Justice Department, which is just stacked, just packed the rafters with attorneys and operatives for the um, radicals, frankly, on behalf of the Obama agenda. And so they take a pull an attorney out of there who was personally donated to the both of Obama's campaigns, and they put her in charge of investigating against the Obama administration, what do you think they're going to find? They found exactly what you, you'd expect. Well, no, no impropriety here. Nothing to see here. Nothing to see here. Just move so, along, people. <laughs> yeah. Oh, but did you see, you know, what Chris Christie did? Now, that that deserves all the federal investigations and attention, but, you know, don't worry about what's going on over here. We got this. We're not we're not big Chris Christie fans over here at Conservative Revolution Radio, but I think he'll take care of himself uh, if there is something that he's involved in. Uh, the guy's just being too slick. I think he does have his hand in that cookie jar, but it does not warrant a federal investigation at all. Right, and it, uh, again, as usual, the left is playing distraction politics, where. You know, they're saying, look at him in New Jersey, look at that. That's what was in the media, the complacent propaganda arm of the administration, which is the mainstream media. You mean CNN and MSNBC, ABC, CBS, and the rest. (laughs) That's what I like to call them. It's kind of like Gilligan's Island. (laughs) They'll, you know, they'll cover anything that distracts us from what's going on in Washington. Why do you think they show pictures of squirrels water skiing and uh, shrimp on treadmills? I mean, you know, that's their that's their big story. You know, we got the panda uh, the panda cams going to go down. And speaking of panda cams going down, Obamacare as oh, that's a racist term, by the way. Did you know? Uh, especially since since Big Old Barry gets out there and even calls it that himself. So he must be he must be calling his other half. Um, racist. His, his white half, his black half is calling his white half a racist. Is that is that what the deal is? Uh, apparently, yeah. Well, brown bag lunch is also a racist phrase, too, I've heard. So what are we supposed to call it, then? I don't know. Off-color sack lunch? <laughs> off right, exactly. Medium mocha mauve, I mean, <laughs> mocha surprise? I mean, you know, I mean, come on, people, this political correctness has to go. This is ridiculous. This is insane. It is it is tearing apart the moral fiber of the United States of America, and it's making the Constitution want... Yeah, I'm telling you, they got the Constitution, and they've got the... Uh, 
the Declaration of Independence and the Bill of Rights all under this protective glass, and I can just see it now. It's going to it's going to self destruct under that glass if this political correctness keeps up. They control the narrative. The left controls the language. The left controls the agenda. It, you know, we're not going to get anywhere until we stop allowing them telling us what we can talk about. All right, let's wrap. It's a losing strategy. Exactly. Let's wrap it up here and let's let's let uh, our listeners know how they can help you. You. Uh, you're looking, you've got a donate button there on uh, joegilbertforcongress.org, and can they shoot you an email? They certainly can. What's your email address? There's a contact button there at the website, and okay. uh, my Facebook page, and we've made it very easy to donate. And, you know, this is, I'm fighting this fight for all Americans. It's not just for the people in my district, and uh, we made it very easy to donate. It's, uh, we accept PayPal. And credit cards, and we got a very secure online donation site. And um, I'm not asking for a lot from anybody. All I'm asking for is a little bit from everybody. And we can make a difference across America. We can shoot a shot across the bow to tell the establishment and the left that we are not going to take it anymore and that the people are supreme, that we, the people, are the sovereign masters of government. And the one thing I want to let people know, and this is kind of important because they don't realize it when they're using PayPal. They don't need to sign up for PayPal because a lot of people have some issues with PayPal for whatever reason. But the beautiful thing about PayPal is if you don't have a credit card or a debit card, they have a little thing called e-check where you can do an electronic check. So that's 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 a wonderful little side item that a lot of people don't realize. So, and this very frugal, fiscal conservative will make your twenty-five or fifty-dollar donation go very far. You'll make a huge impact on this race. That's right. There's no middleman involved here. You're not given to uh, one of these other organizations that uh, goes out and buys Cartier sunglasses. Okay. And those people know who they are. <laughs> Anything uh, uh, last in closing you'd like to add? Uh, just that if you believe in the Constitution, if you believe in the Bill of Rights, if you believe that the, the government works for us, and then this is your race. And uh, when I get to Washington, yes, I'll represent the people of the New York 21st District, but I'm fighting the fight for all of us. All right. Thank you so much. We'll be uh, checking back with you uh, at a later date for more updates. And uh, don't forget, folks, go to Facebook, look for Joe Gilbert for Congress, and go to JoeGilbertForCongress.org. I'm Roger Miller. This is Conservative Revolution Radio. We'll be right back after this. Ever wondered what a bunch of college kids do on spring break in Mexico? Here's your chance to find out. Pick up a copy of My Bad Tequila at MyBadTequila.com or visit Amazon.com. It's available in hardback, paperback, or Kindle or Nook form. Pick up a copy of My Bad Tequila by the author Rico Austin and do it today and join the party at MyBadTequila.com. Conservative Revolution Radio and we're back. I'm Roger Miller and joined on the phone by Steve Aussie, a second time guest here on the Conservative Revolution Radio. He's a financial guru that knows everything that you need to know to get your house in order. And uh, let's say hi to Steve Aussie. How are you doing today, Steve? Hi, nice Jeremy, Roger. Doing just fine up here in Lake Tahoe. Beautiful Lake Tahoe. Not as much snow as you'd like to have this time of year, I understand. A little bit of a drought going on. You're right. I was just in uh, North Dakota for the holidays where it was uh, something like 50 below, so I'm, I'm quite happy with what I got. <laughs> you, you can almost go water skiing this time of year in Tahoe right now with the lack of snow, it seems like. Well, if, oh, I, I, later in the year, it's hard to say. There, are, there is snow on the mountains, so I'm hoping that the uh, water level will come up, but uh, we might get some spring rains. All right, enough talking about the weather and what's going on in, in the Dakota and the Tahoe Basin and, and, and things like that. Let's get into what the subject at hand is. Let's talk about the, well, shall we call it, the, the false prophet has, uh, has uh, brought us numbers of, 6.7% unemployment <laughs> with a record what 92 million people out of uh, out of the workforce or something like that I mean you're the one with the numbers tell us 
Yeah, well, last Friday was the Bureau of Labor Statistics jobs number, and only 74,000 jobs, according to the government themselves, were created, and it's been more like 200,000 jobs the last few months, and um, which was a very slow recovery rate anyway, but this was the smallest number of new jobs since 2011. Now, it could be a fluke. It might be partly weather, and uh, we might be on track next month, and they sometimes uh, revise up. And it shocked the market, certainly, uh, on Monday. I thought about it over the weekend, uh, along with a, a grim Goldman Sachs report. Uh, but they also announced, though, that unemployment fell from 7% to 6.7%, or a five-year low in unemployment. So that looks pretty good, huh? But what, what gets me here is, is, is this. These are the December job numbers, and there's supposed to be an uptick because of seasonal employment, but that didn't seem to exist. So, you know, something's really wrong here. <laughs> I mean... Yeah, we are, we are at this uh, five-year low, uh, supposedly, but if you look uh, beneath the hood, some 347,000 Americans are no longer looking for work in December, so if you're not looking... You're not considered unemployed. This is what the government wants us to hear since 2009 and during Obama's administration. We've been told that the economy has been improving, but that's largely due to accounting tricks rather than any real change in reality. So if you can make unemployment look better by not counting people, if you can claim the economy is growing by ignoring uh, ignoring inflation, uh, you can argue that inflation is low because you don't count food or energy, or you can play tricks with how you compute it. There's a lot of manipulation going on. The the number of, for unemployment has come out from the household survey, the, the so-called household survey, or the, the U3. Each month, about 60,000 households are called and surveyed, and you're asked if you have a job. And if you say no, well, they don't stop there. They ask then if you're looking for a job. And if you're not looking because you're, uh, you've given up or you're working fewer hours than you would like, you're not really fully employed, or if you just want to work but you're not looking, then you're not considered uh, unemployed. Uh, so the number is low only because so many people are no longer in the workforce, uh, in, in the age, the group of ages that where you're able to work but you're not working. The U6 counts all of this, and the real unemployment number for December was 12.1%. Uh, Okay, so for the layperson, this is called cooking the books. Uh, then wouldn't it be wise that maybe we should advise uh, these people that are getting these phone calls to uh, answer in a different way and drive that number back up to where it reflects the 12.1? I don't know. We want the people to lie or the government just... Are they really lying, though? The U I mean... The government does release... The U6, the official number, is just that the lamestream media never never quotes that number. The labor force participation rate is actually at a 35-year low, and people keep dropping out of the market. And the the workforce is called those people that are typically between 16 and 64. It generally doesn't include students or homemakers or persons under 64 that are retired. But uh, we've had nearly 10 million people um, – the, the number of people that could work has increased to nearly 10 million since Barack Obama first entered uh, the White House, and that labor force participation rate is at about 58 percent, and it's been that way for about 52 months in a row. So we're we're not really improving the job situation for our, our citizens. A vast percentage of the uh, the shall we say job gains, uh, if you want to use that loosely, have been in two sectors. One is part time, and two is government. Um, should government jobs uh, be counted even in the employment statistics? I don't think so. Well, the uh, numbers where the increases have been, too, is largely service sector jobs, low-paying service sector jobs, so they're not people that uh, are really being helped a great deal uh, by that. Uh, you know on Wednesday, the ADP, ADP is the company that does private sector payrolls. They don't do payrolls for the government in general. And they actually had a decent number. I, I actually believe that the numbers that have been coming in have been showing some shrinkage in, in government jobs. And to me, that's, that's, that's probably a good sign. The Friday number did include a public service uh, employees. Okay. Now, of course, when you when you said that the, the, the sector of jobs uh, – being the service industry, you're talking about the very same people that want to try to, I don't know, what, what, what do you say, cut your nose off to spite your face? 
They want to raise the minimum wage to 12 or $15 an hour. I mean, I understand that San Jose, California now has a $12 an hour minimum wage, and which is ridiculous. I mean, minimum wage, I think, is archaic and, and, and antiquated and needs to go. Uh, you get, you should be paid what you're worth, not what, what someone deems that you're worth. I mean, I understand we have to have a certain degree of, of standards in our workforce, but, uh, I'm sorry, I don't say that, uh, you know, holding the let, holding the mayo and holding the lettuce or, uh, no onions on that burger is anywhere near, near skilled labor and deserving of $15 an hour. I think there's two things. One is that it probably ought to be what the market will bear if somebody wants to work for less, uh, let them. But the other thing, too, is uh, what are employers going to do with their increased labor costs now? Of course, they're going to pass them on to everybody else in terms of raising their prices. And ultimately, it will normalize back out that you will probably end up working for a wage that will still buy you the same basket of groceries that it did before. It's just a temporary effect to raise uh, wages. And, of course, some people will be put out of work, too, as a result of it. You know, there is one sort of insidious thing, too, is that if the government gives more free handouts, they buy votes, they keep you dependent on the government, and because now you're living off the government, you're not looking for a job, you're not considering unemployed, and so the unemployment rate goes down. So you get more people dependent on the government, and yet you get an improvement in the jobless numbers. Right. And I was going to also bring up something about the minimum wage thing. A lot of... A lot of people are saying, you know, these these people in the service industry, uh, and I'm not talking about the the burger flippers or or the cashiers uh, at the burger joints, but uh, a lot of people fail to realize uh, waitresses and bartenders uh, of that end of the service industry, they they're not subject to let's say a seven dollar and fifty cent minimum wage in California, as I remember. Um, Waitresses and whatnot make somewhere near like two dollars and eighty three cents an hour plus tips. You're familiar with this uh, end of the spectrum? No, no, not so much. Okay, well that's a. Um, we, we need these jobs. We need these jobs, of course, and we, and we don't want to demean them. Uh, but I believe just to force minimum wage. Yeah, heck, why, why don't we force a, a higher wage and force that unemployers have to employ people? And then, you know, that's sort of the direction they're trying to head here. That's socialism. When they, yeah, when they monkey with the economy, it usually has unintended consequences or, or maybe intended consequences in this case. Why don't we just put tracking devices on everybody? I mean, I think they want to do that eventually, but, I mean, they've already put them in the car, so... Why don't we just put them on everybody? Uh, okay, let's see. Where are we going next with this one? Uh, the unemployment. Well, the, the, the market. The market was also down. If, if I can interrupt uh, Monday, not only because of the jobs number, but because Goldman Sachs, who's pretty respected on the street, came out with a fairly uh, dour, fairly uh, negative look at the stock market going forward. So I, I suggest that people consider being defensive, uh, perhaps get a second opinion on their portfolios, because we might, uh, 2014 may be a bumpy year. We had a banner year in 2013 with nearly a 30% return on the S&P, but uh, there's so much going on with money printing, $85 billion, the tapering, uh, the, our debt levels, uh, that the long end of the bond rates are now starting to rise, and we owe so much money if we have to pay more interest on it. Uh, this this all has to have uh, repercussions uh, at some point. Which brings me to Janet Yellen. What are your thoughts on her confirmation? I guess she's okay. I think she may even be more accommodative than um, Bernanke was, meaning that she may even be more for keeping those printing presses rolling, which, you know, has helped the market, but uh, it, its negative long-term increases are, uh, I mean, effects are going to be that it just keeps devaluating the dollar, and at some point, uh, us, uh, we import a lot of products, and our dollars won't buy as much of those, and at you, some point, it could cause a collapse of the currency. You still can't make, uh, you still can't make any money on a T-bill or an investment account as far as, you know, uh, interest rates, if they keep doing that. Um, you know, they can keep the low end down. They can keep the what's called the Fed funds uh, rate down. But the longer end of the, the spectrum for uh, 10 years and so forth, at some point that, that will float back up. And it, and it has risen uh, over the last year, uh, and that's why they're buying their own bonds is to try to force that rate to stay down. But they're, they're talking about reducing asset purchases, reducing 
buying their own bonds. In a strange concept, you print money and then loan it to yourself. Uh, but they have announced the taper, of course, and they may continue to taper. However, one of their metrics is the uh, job situation, and so it's unclear at the next meeting whether they will continue uh, at this rate or look to see that the economy is not flying strongly on its own as they were hoping for. I mean, do you see this as it looks like it's setting up for the perfect storm, like uh, you're talking, you know, with the unemployment uh, figures and uh, the job participation rate being at a 35-year low, which puts us into the to the era of Jimmy Carter. Uh, you have um, right now you have a stagnant economy, which sounds like Jimmy Carter. Uh, but the one thing that the dynamic that's different than under Jimmy Carter is I guess they figured out if you print more money now, uh, unlike Jimmy Carter, um, back then interest rates rose and what the prime rate was like 18% by the time he was out the door. Uh, but the, but the, but the economy was somewhat better than it is now, which I, I, I don't know how that works. And you're the economist. I, 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 maybe you could shed some light to the listeners to like why it would be important for maybe our prime rate to actually rise a bit and and lay off the printing of the money because you talk about the devaluation of the dollar and and, and there's there's a lot of uh, countries that are selling off their gold reserves because and that's devaluing gold because I know gold was up at nineteen hundred dollars an ounce at one point last year and then it's settled down to tw- like twelve fifty somewhere in there and it's just kind of wallowing there. So uh, any thoughts on that? Do you see a parallel here that we might be heading towards? Uh, like, uh, as we know, the stock market is artificial right now. It's artificially bolstered by the fact that that's the only pl- the only game in town, shall we say. Yeah, a lot of money has uh, gone from what would have been retirees invested in bonds that gave a reasonable yield that they can live on and could count on to that money going into the market, and that will start to rotate as interest rates rise. Uh, the money from the stock market will probably then transfer its way back to bonds, but, you know, the, the concern I have there is that we have so much debt, and uh, at some point the cost just to service the debt, I think it was the CBOE, the con- Congressional Budget Office suggested that by 2020, if interest rates are on track for more normal normal value, 75% of our tax receipts will just be used to pay off the interest on the money that we owe. So how, how's the country going to get anything useful done if it's all being burned up in interest, just the way if uh, you or I ran up our credit card debts at 20% to the max? Uh, we, we don't have anything left at the end of the month in terms of uh, spending power. Here's the question, because I, I'm a little ignorant to this, because I don't really pay attention to it. What is the current prime lending rate? I don't know, Prime, if I would have uh, had that in front of me before now, um, I could have told you. I think I think the 10-year, though, is heading for, but, but when it hits 5%, I think things are going to start uh, to be very troublesome. Um I'd have to look it up. I, th- I think the ten-year is probably around four percent right now. Could be, could be wrong. Which is uh, uh, traditionally a lot lower than it used to be. Uh, as I remember, uh, in the even the early nineteen nineties, late nineteen eighties, I mean, seven seven and a half percent was not uh, unheard of, and and that was the benchmark that uh, automobile lenders would use uh, to base, uh, like Ford Motor Credit would use. Uh, to lend money on automobile loans, and you know those fourteen and fifteen percent automobile loans are long gone uh, because of it. And and now, I mean, everybody's offering zero percent and things like this. And so money is, shall we say, money is cheap uh, right now. And like you said, the dollar is devalued. So at some point, it's got it's got to look like if it jumps up, it's going to it's going to take its impact somewhere. And does not that set up the perfect storm for a major market correction on the Dow? Well, it does, yeah. Uh, the uh, U.S. 10-year Treasury bond is 2.9% right now, um, so the rate has risen. We were in a 30-year bull market for the bonds. It's somewhat hard for people maybe to understand, but for about 30 years, interest rates have been declining, and that's 
a bull or a good thing for the um, uh, treasury market because if you own a bond that is paying those higher rates and you want to sell it, you can sell it for more than you bought it because people would rather have your 10% bond than the current ones that are only yielding 5%. But now we have nowhere to go but up in terms of yields, and that is that is not going to be great for uh, people that are holding those bonds because uh, new bonds will come out at a higher rate than what they bought them for. But when they do mature, when those bonds do mature, the government uh, pays back the principal, and then you can use that to roll it into a new bond yielding a higher rate. But I still worry about the fact of uh, inf inflation, just that we keep continue, uh, continuing the printing of money, and that rising interest rates are going to make paying back our staggering debt uh, impossible and, and perhaps kind of a death spiral. Now, th that famous death spiral uh, is being perpetuated by the debacle of, uh, of what they're saying is going to be a success, the uh, Affordable Care Act. <laughs> As we know, we, we all know what's coming down the pike there, but being that you're in an industry where you deal with, um, shall we say, corporate-level people and investors and things like that, what's the buzz going on around about this uh uh, this whole thing with Obamacare, are you getting a, a, a feel from people that uh, that maybe the, the lamestream media is not uh, putting out there? I mean, I, I know you hear the truth, so what's your spin on what's going on? Uh, I, I hate to use spin because, like Bill O'Reilly said, it's no spin zone. But spin zone, yeah. <laughs> well, it is spin. I mean, it, it's it, it's... And not a bad way. Um, what, what's your take, shall we say, on what Obamacare is doing to our economy? Well, as we know, uh, a lot of people have, uh, companies that could have trimmed back their employment levels because they don't want to be at a level where they have to participate in Obamacare, so they want to stay under the radar in terms of number of, uh, of employments. They've cut lots, lots of folks back to 30 hours, so they don't have to pay benefits. Uh, in some ways, it's been good for business because business profits have been pretty good, but it's only it's come at the cost of uh, slashing labor costs a, a great deal. So uh, companies have hordes of cash, and they can deploy those in mergers and acquisitions and, and other things. But uh, we, the working people, are, are certainly suffering. I know when Obama uh, puffed himself up and said he's increased the number of jobs, uh, somebody in the audience said, yes, I know, I have three of them myself. And have you seen the uh, have you seen the latest thing? Speaking of Obama, we want to just before we wrap up here. I wanted to bring this up because I I I see this as is a really scary sign. Obama uh, just a couple days ago, uh, a few days ago now said, um, "Well, you know, I'm not going to wait on Congress. I'm going to go ahead and start, uh, you know, writing some executive orders, and I'm going to start doing this stuff." Sounds like um, Fidel Castro to me. He, well, you know, he's also done this thing that I think all presidents have done, which used to be a rule that uh, the president could make appointments uh, in his cabinet and not have to have them com confirmed by Congress because back in the horse and buggy days, sometimes it was hard to reconvene everybody, so they gave them some flexibility when they were be between sessions to do this. And that's been done for a long time, and it's before the Supreme Court this week to, to evaluate that. And from what I hear, it seems like the Supreme Court is inclined to uh, make that, uh, curtail those kind of efforts where he can appoint people, and just because the Senate isn't convened at the time, it goes unchallenged and unconfirmed, and uh, perhaps uh, clipping his wings just a little bit in terms of his ability to make these unconstitutional appointments, but he certainly is free with those executive orders. Yeah, those recess appointments, as they're calling them, and uh, I know there was a ruling last year about them, and, uh, and it never really got any legs, but... We shall see. 2014 will be an interesting year. It is an, a midterm election year. Um, do you see anything uh, swinging in the Senate? <laughs> uh, you see a big swing in the Senate, or is it all uh, hinged on what Obamacare does? Well, I think it is, and that could be what swings it. I, uh, you know, uh, 10 months or so is an eternity in, in politics, but it seems to me that if uh, near the end of the year, we already know by internal documents by the administration that they're expecting uh, 
was it 30 or maybe 50 million uh, policies to be canceled once the employer mandate kicks in. I hope that those pink slips start coming out before the elections. And uh, we, we saw how many people lost their, quote, junk policies uh, going into this. If that happens on a large scale before the election, I think the public's going to be very incensed, and that's going to help uh, conservatives gain more seats in the Senate. That's certainly the hope. You know, things change quickly. It was just when... Um, when uh, Cruz was filibustering a couple months ago, it was the death of Republican and conservatives, conservatives for a decade. And now people like Krautheimer are saying Obamacare may be the death of liberalism for, for a generation. So it, uh, it changes quickly, but it could swing in our favor. And have you heard the latest? Have you heard about, uh, I hear some rumbling about uh, a governor in Nevada going to run against Harry Reid to uh, challenge him? Well, that's my state. Uh, yeah, Governor Sandoval may challenge Harry Reid, yes. Now, that that should make for an interesting fight because huh, uh, I understand that Governor Sandoval has a, uh, a very strong following and uh, he can bring a lot of the Hispanic vote to the table, too. Yeah, he's popular. Um, I uh, followed and uh, actually was over at Sharon Engel who ran against Harry uh, a couple years ago. And she's a good friend, and she narrowly lost, and it might have had something to do with a, a little bit of underhanded activities. But uh, Sandoval, yeah, he might be able to do it. And, and you're right, his, his last name gives him a ticket to acquire some voters, and he's uh, quite the popular, quite the charming uh, governor, and it could very well mean trouble for Harry. Lastly, who do you like for 2016 so far? How's it shaping up for uh, president? Well, I sure am stuck there because I'm much more of a very strong conservative. But, um, you know, we may have to do what Buckley said. We, we may have to kind of hold our nose at some point and vote for the most conservative person that can win. Uh, at one time, maybe, and holding the nose part fit, that, that might have been um, uh, Mr. Bridgegate there, but I don't know how he's going to fare on this. Boy, he gave himself no... No wiggle room. If if any memos come out that show that he had anything to do with shutting down that bridge, he's done. He made it very clear, but and I admire the fact that he stood up in front of the press for two hours and and didn't make excuses and fired people for the kind of stuff you wish Obama would do, which is take responsibility and get rid of the people that uh, are the cause of it. But uh, he gave himself no wiggle room, and boy, the the ground game on the Democrats is strong. They're going to be looking for dirt they, if they find it on Christie. Uh, he may may be out of the rain. I tend to favor folks that are ideologically the same as me, but I'm not so sure those are the folks that can win. All right. All right. We're, we're out of time right now, but I wanted to uh, mention to people that they can go to, you have a website, steveaussie.com. Is that correct? Yeah, A-U-S-E. You can also just Google Steve Incline Village, Nevada, and that's another way to get to me. Thank you for that. And you're on Facebook and you're on Twitter, Steve underscore Aussie on Twitter. And uh, and your Facebook page. So uh, we look look forward to having you on a on a three one nineteen sixty three nineteen sixty three the the year we lost lost JFK. Okay, uh, hold on a second. Here we had a little beep in. There we go. Uh, give us that number again. Seven seven five eight three one nineteen sixty three. All right. This is Conservative Revolution Radio. I'm Roger Miller, and we thank Steve Ossie once again. Uh, look them up. When you get a chance, go to steveaussie.com. We'll be right back after this. Conservative Revolution Radio, I'm Roger Miller. We're out of time, and we went long with Steve Ossie, and it was a great show. And uh, special thanks to Steve Ossie. Go to steveaussie.com, and don't forget to go to joegilbertforcongress.org. And uh, tune in next week, because we'll get to those stalkers, and go to breakingobama.com. See you, bye!